first up, let's talk about uh, what you do. You're currently executive director of Linux International. What exactly is that? Linux International was started in 1994 as a vendor organization. Uh, the person who started it, a person by the name of Patrick de Cruz, was in Australia, and he saw that there were lots of Linux user groups starting up. But he felt that there was a need for a vendor organization that could help business people understand what the uses of Linux in particular and open source in general were for business and the advantages of using it. Uh, help to describe things like the, uh, the licensing, helped them to understand that while the software was free as in freedom, it was not necessarily free as in beer, and that we wanted to be able to have people make money providing service rather than have them make money providing uh, simply products. A lot of people, as you rightfully said, think free is free beer. Um, how do you change people's mindsets when it comes to that? I think the real problem there is that people are only concentrating on the traditional uh, ways of thinking about software. And when I say traditional, it's, it's, it's ironic in the fact that in the period between 1943 and 1977, there really wasn't any such thing as shrink wrap software. There wasn't the number of computers necessary to sustain a mass production of software. And software was actually written individually for people's needs, uh, with a few exceptions. So the concept of going down to your local store and, and picking up your computer and picking up your uh, five or six packages of, of software uh, was not possible unless, of course, picking it up meant that you could lift a 480-ton computer and you had three-phase power in your house along with water cooling. So... Uh, so, but the period between 1977 and 1990, we saw a number of computers start up which were uh, lower in price and obviously able to be uh, purchased by somebody at a store. And the mass production of software came in. Now, what people really want, in our estimation, is really service. Um, the people have a problem to solve and they want that problem solved in a way that, that fits them best. And that brings us back to having the bulk of software being able to be available over the net. The software that you typically would pay a company like Microsoft to produce for you in the form of say open office is available over the net. And then you pay your money to have it tailored exactly to what your needs are. Whether that be something simple like simply fixing a bug in a time frame that, that makes sense to you, or having an extension made so it be able to fit into your um, business better. And that, we think, is very valuable. We think it's actually almost priceless. Mad Dog, let's talk about the contention about the cost of ownership between proprietary software and open source software. What are your thoughts about that? Let me illustrate that with a small company in Brazil that wanted to investigate the rainforests for new plastics, new medicines. The software, the proprietary software that was available for them to do that was only available in English and was extremely expensive. It was only available from a company in the United States. Uh, nobody in the small company spoke English. They all spoke Portuguese. And when they went and approached this company to have the software transferred or translated into Portuguese, the company said, no, it's not in our best business interest. So the value of that company's software to the small company was zero. In any case, the, the little company said, let's see if we can have an open source developer duplicate this software and if we can uh, have them produce it so it prompts in Portuguese so we can use it. And they were able to do that. And the software now allowed them to exist as a small company. So to this small company, the value of the open source software was actually infinite. Because without it, they would not exist. With it, they could. So the total cost of ownership, unfortunately, has been taken to be if the software exists, and if it does something according to what we want it to, 
How much does it cost us to buy it, install it, and train our people to use it? Not the question of, does it actually meet our needs best, and how, how well does it allow us to do our jobs? That's a different question that people hardly ever answer. And that's the value of open source, because you can tailor it to meet your needs instead of what the manufacturer thinks your needs are. A lot of end users who haven't come across Linux, or perhaps have heard about it, they don't really quite understand that it could be quite easy to use. How would you respond to that? Well, I would suggest that they simply take a little time out and try it. Um, either by perhaps coming to an event like Linux World and taking a look at it, or if they're in the case of a, a company that is you know, in a large city or something like that, perhaps finding their local Linux user group and attending a meeting of that, or they could perhaps visit a university or ask for some consulting firm to come in and present them a presentation on what Linux is like. I think that today, Linux is shipping on about one third of all the server systems that are shipping. Uh, another third is proprietary and commercial Unix systems, and another third is Microsoft uh, products of different types. The, today, it's used on most of the supercomputers which are being developed, and quite a few of them which are already in use. This coming December, there will be a supercomputer of 10,000 processors which will be using Linux to help predict the weather as part of NASA's uh, ongoing studies. That will be the largest computer in the world. In things like embedded systems, like things like TV recorders, cameras, things like that, Linux is currently the third most used operating system in new designs. And so the desktop is actually the last marketplace that we have to penetrate. And IDC tells us that Linux is now selling, outselling Apple systems on the desktop. That does not mean that we're taking those systems away from Apple. It means that we are taking them away from another large computer company that we may have heard of. And plus, in the emerging economies, uh, Linux is very strong on the desktop. So I would suggest to people that they may want to take a look at it, you know, perhaps pick up a, a magazine on it or go down to a local bookstore and find a book on Linux. Usually that has a CD in the back of it that goes along with the book and allows you to install Linux on a, on a system, uh, either one that already supports Windows and you can have it dual boot. You can choose either Linux or a Windows system or perhaps on a, a system that you no longer need, Linux works very well on low-end Pentium systems and, and even 486s. Some people even run it on 386s and systems without memory management. One thing I want to touch upon with you, Mad Dog, is the aspect of the, a number of different distros that distribute Linux. And uh, one of the contentious issues that people talk about is the fact that they're all packaged slightly differently. Uh, distros might put them in, put certain files in different folders. Now, how do you react to that in terms of providing perhaps a standard uh, for consumers to work with? There is a standards group called the Free Standards Group, uh, www.freestandards.org, and they are in the process and have been for some time in developing a standard which will allow each distribution to be different in the way, in the services that it provides for people, but yet be the same for an application that's going to be installed. So if you were to develop your application on one distribution, which was free standards compliant, you would then be able to uh, deploy it on any other distribution, which was free standards compliant. And the, they just came out with their latest uh, standard called FSG 2.0, and they are now taking that out to the distributions and asking them to do the conformance testing and they're taking it to the ISVs to allow the ISVs to also be conformant. Is this a perfect solution currently? The answer is no. There may be some issues with it, but the issues allow the ISVs 
to fix the problems with a simple bug fix